Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gents. Uh, welcome to this um, FOMC and, to a lesser extent, Bank of Japan preview webcast, webinar, whatever you want to call it. First and foremost, I have to put up a risk warning and disclaimer, um, part of the course for these events. Um, nothing that you hear in this particular webinar should be, con should be construed as trading advice. Essentially what we're trying to do is run the rule over a whole host of potential scenarios. Um, what the Fed is hoping or what, what the Fed is likely to say um, and the potential market reactions to that. So once I've got um, these risk warnings out of the way, we can get started. So. Um, yeah, basically, I think if anyone is expecting anything significant out of the Fed from this April meeting, it's unlikely we're going to see it. We're not, go we're not going to get a rate rise. We are not going to get a press conference. Um, but what I'd like to talk about is this Bloomberg page here. It's WI. RP, and it's market expectations for rate rises over the course of the rest of this year. Now, those, those probabilities and the probabilities that I'm most interested in are the probability of a hike. So in June, the market is assigning around about a 19.6% possibility that the Federal Reserve will raise interest rates. April, they're assigning a 0% possibility of a rate hike, a 2% probability of a cut, <laughs> which I find <laughs> highly amusing, and a 98% probability that rates will remain unchanged. So that looks like the most probable outcome. In fact, I would argue that it is the only likely outcome. Um, but ultimately, what we're most interested in these numbers here, and in particular, the June number, because the June number, a one in five possibility, less than a one in five possibility that we could get a rate rise in June, seems a little bit too dovish for my liking. And I think, and Colin probably agrees with me, that I think the Federal Reserve may want to move the odds of that up slightly if they are really if they really want to keep the prospect of a June rate rise in play. And and, and really this yeah. is all about perception. It's not about whether they will do it. It's not about whether they won't do it. It's what they want the market to think. And at the moment they want the market to think that June is a live meeting. At the moment, according to that chart, June is not a live meeting. And I think the Federal Reserve in its statement may want to readdress that balance ever so slightly. And if they do that, that could prompt a U.S. dollar rally. It probably won't prompt a sustainable U.S. dollar rally, but nonetheless, it will prompt a little bit of a push higher in the dollar and a push lower in the euro, a push lower in the pound, and a, and, a, and a push higher in the dollar yen. I don't know whether you want to expand on any of that, Colin. Uh, absolutely, thank you, Michael. Yes, uh, one of the, I, I do keep track of the the Fed as the, as their speakers have been going through, and particularly some of the regional voters and the the swing voters. And, and the Fed's kind of been in in three camps. And there's there's the, the dovish camp, the neutral camp, and and the hawkish camp. So the dovish camp has kind of been pushing towards delaying rate hikes as long as possible. And the neutral camp includes Fed Chair Yellen and most of them that have kind of well, we'll keep an eye on the data. And basically, the Fed wants to keep their options open. And then there's the hawkish camp, who are people like uh, Kansas City's Esther George, who who want to raise rates right now, and um, and the, the ones I've been watching for the most that, that have been swing voters this year have been Bullard and Rosengren. They're the two more dovish of of the regional governors uh, voting this year, and and George and Mester are the two more leaning to the hawkish side. And uh, Bullard has been going back and forth. When the oil price crashed, he went from hawkish to dovish. As oil came back, he went kind of from dovish back to neutral heading towards hawkish, but both him and Rosengren, who is a dove, have both said to the markets that they think the street's been overly pessimistic about the uh, prospects for a rate rise, they think the street's been overly dovish, and they've been trying through their 
come into to their speeches to nudge people back towards the middle. I think the Fed would prefer to see that June number at, instead of at 20% more up back up towards 50%. And I think the the bond I'll market in general has been more dovish. And and because if you look at the the currency market has been sitting just below 95, and, and, and my feeling is as we, as we look at this that when the dollar index was up at 100 was when people were thinking there was four hikes this year, and at 95 people are thinking did two hikes this year, and, and if we were to move to zero hikes like the bond market, you'd probably see the U.S. dollar crash back, to index crash back to 90. So. As Michael noted, if you see the, the Fed kind of steering people still towards two hikes this year, the dollar index might go up a little bit, perhaps peak back above 95 a little bit, and that's probably about it, because the currency market is already essentially pricing in still two hikes this year. If you're going to get two hikes, you're looking at June and December. The, the Fed would want to stay away from the election campaign, particularly since it looks like it's going to be a, a quite a wild one with uh, with Trump and Clinton becoming the, the presumptive nominees. It's going to be a pretty crazy election campaign. I think the Fed's going to want to stay, stay, stay clear of that. If you go in June, it's after the primaries and before the conventions. So if that's the time, that's the, that's the ideal time if the Fed's going to do two hikes this year to, to raise one. Yeah, I think that's right. I think the optimum time is June. Unfortunately for the Fed, I think there's a distinct possibility that the data may move move against them. It may mm -hmm. force their hand a little bit because mm -hmm. thus far the data this year hasn't been particularly great, particularly on on the manufacturing side, but also I think you'll find on the consumer side. Um, we saw that disappointing um, Dallas Fed um, survey yesterday. I think it was yesterday, wasn't it? And some of the some of the respondent comments were, were um, well, let's just say that they didn't point to an awful lot of optimism about the, U the about the U.S. economy. I mean, one one of the comments um, that was made by one of the one of the speakers was um, something about um, ISIS gas, oil, not really much to get excited about. <laughs> yeah. You know, and that's pretty much Gallo's that's pretty much Gallo's comments. And it doesn't yeah. speak to an awful lot of confidence in in with respect to the manufacturing sector. Furthermore, if yeah. we look at durable goods and we look at retail sales and I'm I'm gonna display a little chart of that here. On the right hand column here we've got durable goods numbers for the last um two to three months. And apart from a decent number in January, um, we had a horrible number in February, and we, we've had a disappointing number in March. Now, these numbers here are excluding transport. Transports are very, very volatile. Mm. I tend to exclude them. And the, the total durable goods numbers um, since January 2015, that's the net decline. So over the course of the last 15 to, 18, 15 to 16 months, Durable goods, which is essentially white goods, big ticket items like big screen TVs, um, you're talking about potential home improvement, that sort of thing. That's been pretty disappointing. Um, and retail sales, again, over the course of the last three months, m minus 0.7, minus 0.3. So Q1 has been very, very disappointing for certainly the U.S. consumer. They, they've shown that they're got no indication that they want to go out and spend money, and this is despite the fact that fuel prices in particular are well below the levels that we saw a year ago. Mm -hmm. So I would agree that jobs growth has been very, very good. It's been very, very steady. We haven't seen that much in the way of what I would call significant wage growth, apart from a spike in January, where we had a big jump of 0.5. And ultimately, in answer to your question about whether or not the U.S. economic figures suggest a rate rise is likely, I would just suggest a rate rise is not likely based on the data that we've seen thus far. But that, being that as it may, I don't think that will stop the Fed from being a little bit hawkish and talking up the prospect of a rate hike, even if one is not likely. Because if they talk up the prospect of a rate hike, they at least have the option of dialing back on that rhetoric. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
Uh, yes, and I think one of the things we're watching at, for the U.S. is, for example, if you look at the Dallas Fed, is awful. And there's no question Dallas region's in a recession. That's the heart of the, the oil sector in America, and, and they're just getting yeah. crushed. And, uh, and Richmond was a little better. They, they fell off. And, and so the, the thing with the U.S. is, and I think it's something the Fed's kind of got to manage, is that you've got and certainly a major chunk of, a major region of the economy is, is no doubt in recession, and some of the other areas are doing reasonably well. And how do you manage that? And I guess there, I think there's also a bit of expectations there as well. You'd expect to see a bit of a slowdown in in, say, consumer spending or durable goods orders, as the Fed starts raising rates, as people get used to, just in, in reaction to the December hike. And, and then the, the question is, does this persist? Because normally the Fed starts raising rates, it's a sign that the economy is good, people get over the transition phase, and then, and then things go again. But one thing we've seen with the Fed this year is they've kind of been muddying the waters. They're, they, they've, been, um, they've been waffling a lot. You know, they talked about confused. four rate hikes they were going to raise in March, and then they didn't. And, then, mm. and so we're getting a lot of really mixed signals from the Fed itself, and I think that's not helping matters. So it's a, we're into a bit of a chicken or, an, or the egg ar argument here as well with the, is the data slow meaning that the Fed has to do, do waffle on, continue to waffle on rates, or is the data slow because the Fed's been waffling on rates? The answer is probably a bit of both, and, uh, and so it's a, it's a funny one when, when they say they're open to data and then at the same time they want to do follow some kind of a, a program. So, and that's where I think there's a lot of confusion in, 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 the, in the economy, in the, in the markets, and, and what have you. And until this kind of settles itself out, we'll probably see more of these kind of back and forth arguments and, and discussions, because it's kind of things kind of support both sides. Yeah, um, I've been asked another question. If the Fed are hawkish, will equity market sentiment improve? and overcome a possible downturn. Well, I think the jury is out on that. I don't know whether you've got a view on this, but I think if the Fed is slightly hawkish, I think it'll cap any equity market rally through 2100, certainly on the S&P. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're pretty much close to the all-time highs. Yes, we have broken higher more broadly um, over the past, say, three or four weeks, certainly across the board. Um, certainly the UK, the FTSE 100 has broken higher, the DAX has broken higher. But I think what struck me about these moves higher and the fact that the S&P is now in positive territory for the year is how weak these, these recoveries have been. Now, there's been an awful lot of chatter in the press. I don't know whether any of you guys have been watching Bloomberg um, over the course of the past few days, but there's been talk about Golden Cross on the S&P 500. And those of you who don't know what a golden cross is, it's when the 50-day moving average crosses above the 200-day moving average. And it's generally perceived to be a very positive signal. But it's only conceived to be a very positive signal if the market is actually doing something, so if it's reversing something. So in this case, a golden cross will be very, very positive at the end of a long-term downtrend. By the, by the opposite token, a death cross, where the 50-day moving average crosses below the 200-day moving average, would, you'd, you'd want to take notice of it at the end of an uptrend. So in the context of this particular discussion, and I, do, I have covered it in some detail in my weekly video, which can be found at um, youtube.com forward slash CMC Markets PLC, we can see here on the S&P 500 that we've seen the 50-day moving average cross above the 200-day moving average. But look what the 200-day moving average is doing. It's pretty flat. And also, we had a similar crossing in the middle of December last year, and we failed. And, and I think the question that's being asked is, is this another failure, or is this maybe a precursor to a break of the previous highs and for a move higher. Well, ultimately, we don't know. What Could you we think do... they chart it a little longer, Michael, to like a one year or a year and a half? Yeah. That's better. I think what's important to note is, is the context of these, these – that's good there – of these golden crosses, which are, if you look, the, the S&P's basically been in the sideways trend for the last year and a half. 
And, and when we go into sideways trends, the 50-day and the moving average just kind of keep crossing each other back and forth. And, and so to look at these, the, the golden cross and the death cross for that matter, they lose their relevance when you're in a, in a sideways trend. And, and that's what Michael's kind of been getting at. Whereas if you looked at the uh, previously in that late 24, early 2015, S&P was trending higher, 50-day was consistently above the 200-day. You had the first death cross, now, and, and then you had, and you, and it felt, and it confirmed a big sell-off. Now, what ended up happening was this, instead of continuing lower into a downtrend, we went into a sideways trend, but still that, that was the signal of the trend change, that first cross in, I guess that was about September or so, but these last two uh, are, are just, they just happen within sideways trends, uh, sideways trends. Yeah, and I think this is the point that I'm really sort of trying to make here. I've just gone mm -hmm. and brought this up one second. Let me just open this in a slightly different format so that we can get a better flavor of it. Okay, so let's blow this up to about 200%. So, in, this, was, this is what happened at the end of 2011, beginning of 2012. Now, we've got the two moving averages. There's the 50-day crossing the 200-day, and it's crossing higher. Um, and this is the end of the downtrend. But what is also happening here is that we bottomed out around just above 1,000, made a slight double bottom there. We made a new peak here. We came back, didn't take out the previous low. And what we've got here is a triangle a potential triangle breakout. So we've got the previous downtrend in place, we've got a new uptrend starting to develop, and the price action is starting to compress. And it's compressing in a way that ultimately, when it breaks, it will break very sharply in the direction of the breakout. So what we've got here is we've got the market being capped by the 200-day moving average after acting as support acts as resistance, resistance, resistance. We've got the break of the downtrend line, and then a few days later, we get the golden cross. So when you get all of those factors all at once, or within a few days of each other, all the 50 and the 200 are doing is merely confirming what's happened with respect to your primary indicators, the trend line break, the break above resistance of the 200-day moving average. So ultimately what I'm saying is, fairly simply, if you're looking for an indication of a trend reversal, just the 50 and the 200 crossing is not enough. You need other confirmatory signals, and ultimately we're not getting them at the moment. And actually, if anything, we are actually getting potential, a potential reversal forming on the daily chart here because what we've got is a potential um, evening star reversal, potential bearish engulfing day there as well. And that in itself could actually cause this to start to roll over and drift lower back towards the 50-day moving average and this series of lows here. So am I taking any notice of this golden cross? Short answer, no. Right, so that's, the S agree. so that's the S&P 500. We've got these series of peaks here. We've got the November peaks here. And then we've got the other peaks from last year, early last year, all the way back here. So there's, a, there's an awful lot of resistance coming in above 2,100, and ultimately you have to ask yourself the question, what would prompt the S&P 500 to break higher at a time when earnings estimates are continuing to be revised lower, and the Fed is going to be very, very reluctant to ease, let alone hike? That's the question I ask myself when I look at these equity markets. And it's a pretty yeah. similar, uh, sorry, you were going to say something? Oh, I was just going to say, it, it's quite interesting when I look at the, the earnings that have been coming out this this quarter, because we've had a, uh, and, and it also works back into the Fed a bit as well, which is that we're, we're, we're kind of getting a, a mixed quarter here in that people were really pessimistic heading in. About, uh, and you'll recall the guidance from previous, uh, from Q, last court, last time around, was very negative. People were really pessimistic. And this time, we have had some, a, a fair number of positive surprises overall. I don't think things were quite as bad as what they were thinking, but we've had quite a few high profile misses as well. We had Apple, we've had Boeing, we've had Microsoft, we've had Google, and, but we've had some positive surprises from names like DuPont and, and P&G. So it's a mixed quarter. And I think one of the things we're getting here in, in earnings was that uh, one of the reasons forecast came down was the higher dollar was hitting was hitting court u s corporate earnings and um 
and, and, and was and was impacting that uh, those forecasts going forward. The dollar has come down, and uh, and so some companies have said, well, the forex impact is easing, our forecasts are improving, whereas other companies haven't gotten there yet. I had figured this quarter would be too soon to to see that, so I was shocked that, that Dupont even and others have even done it at all. I thought it would be the next one of the next two earnings rounds of earnings that we start to see more of the the benefits of the U.S. dollar retreat. But that goes circles back to the Fed and the U.S. dollar, which is I don't think the Fed wants to go too aggressive and push the dollar index back up towards 100 because that crushes corporate earnings. And 95 is helping. 90 would probably be a lot better for them. So it's a matter now of do they do they stay this course of, of two rate hikes, which the currency has priced in. I don't think you want to go they won't, they won't go hawkish beyond that. And then, then at the same time, if they go dovish, then that could actually help the, the earnings side. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, so I mean, <clears throat> excuse me. So I think we're in a little bit in the corridor of uncertainty right here. Yeah. You've got you've got resistance at 95. It looks to be fairly well supported around about 93. But overall, I think the bias for the Fed would be for the dollar index to drift a little bit lower, mm -hmm. but not but not aggressively lower. And that's yeah. essentially, I think, why you've seen um, euro dollar struggle to really push higher to any great degree. And ultimately, if you think that the next move in the dollar is going to be lower rather than higher, then ultimately you've got to think to yourself, how are the Fed going to manage that? And ultimately, I think the way they'll, they'll manage it at, at worst is they'll, they'll come across as slightly positive, which will make the, the market think that June is still on the table. But ultimately, it will cap equity markets to an extent because it'll keep the equity markets off balance because they're not, not really sure what the Fed's going to do in June. But ultimately, right. it'll also stop markets driving the dollar higher as well. So what does that mean for dollar-yen? Because we're talking about the Fed at the moment, and the likelihood is we'll probably get a very nuanced statement with a slight hint at tightening, and, you know, and, the, and the hawks will take what they want from it, and the doves will take what they want from it, and unfortunately never the twain will meet. But ultimately that could cause a bit of a push higher in the dollar. But ultimately my view on dollar-yen is we're going to 106. So the big question then is how do we get there? Uh, now, we could get there as a result of what the Bank of Japan do tomorrow. Ultimately, I don't think it's really going to be of that much consequence. I think once Dolly Yen decides it wants to go somewhere, it goes there irrespective of what the central bank wants it to do or not. The only thing that they can control is the speed at which it gets there. And ultimately, I think that's what the Bank of Japan is probably more worried about than anything else at the moment. Certainly what we've seen here would appear to suggest that we're probably going to start to settle into a bit of a range. But ultimately, I still expect dollar yen to come back to 106.50. Why? Because that's the 38.2 retracement of this entire up move from the lows at 75 to the highs here. We've broken out on this head and shoulders reversal or potential triple top, whatever you want to call it. Our minimum price objective brings us in a 106.68, which also coincides with a 38.2% retracement. So I think, and I've been saying, I have been saying this since pretty much two months ago, once we broke below this level here, 106 was my target. Um, you know, if you go back to a video that I recorded at in the middle of February, as well as my my colleague Jasper, we pretty much agreed the same sort of thing. Once we broke this this support level here, 106 is really only a matter of time. Now, the big question is, how do we get there? We could go all the way back to 112, 113, or 114. But overall, whatever you think about helicopter money in Japan, we've already seen the effects of what negative rates did to the yen. They didn't send it down; they sent it up. So ultimately, it's a question of how effective do you think the Bank of Japan can be by going all in. It's pretty much all in at the moment. The Bank of Japan uh, pretty much owns 10% of the, the Japanese stock market. And ultimately, we haven't seen any evidence of inflation, and we haven't seen any evidence whatsoever of a pickup in economic activity, which is not surprising considering the, uh, the recent earthquakes. It's going to take time for anything that the Bank of Japan does to help pick up economic activity, and ultimately it's down to that third arrow. 
Shinzo Abe's third arrow, structural reform. And ultimately, in the absence of structural reform, central banks are finding that they're operating at the limits of their ability to um, control what the dollar, what, what, their, what their currency is doing. And, uh, and ultimately, if the Bank of Japan is up against the Federal Reserve, and as Colin said, you know, if, if investors are pricing in two or three rate rises this year in dollar-yen and they only get one, what does that do to the dollar-yen? It sends the dollar down because the market's positioned wrongly. I'm being asked if I was Mr. Corroda, what would I do? Well, I couldn't, I couldn't really do much more than what I'm trying to do now. Ultim ultimately, it's up to the politicians. All, the, all central bankers can do is try and provide the conditions with which that, cent that, that governments can implement structural reforms. If governments refuse to implement structural reforms, and, and this, is, this is just as true for Mr. Corroda as it is for Mr. Draghi. Mr. Draghi is facing the exact same problems. What we could get later tonight or early tomorrow morning is we could get the Bank of Japan announce the potential to basically pay banks to lend money uh, in the same way that Mr. Draghi announced those June TLTROs, where basically he said that he would pay banks up to 0.4% to lend money to the real economy. The problem with that is, you know, is the loan demand there? And people will only borrow money if they think there's an even chance that they'll get that money back and more in terms of sales, revenue growth, and that sort of thing. And we're not, we're not seeing that at the moment. Now, the, the U.S. earnings season is, is disappointing. And that is what deters investment, We've seen Apple's results overnight. You know, you know, the, the, the stock price now is down around 7 or 8% despite the fact that it still generated $10 billion in profits on revenues of $51 billion. But it's the first lower revenues in, in 13 years, in 51 quarters. And ultimately, it's all about expectations. And $51 billion is not too shabby. But unfortunately, this is Apple we're talking about, and expectations are a lot higher than that. So let's move on. So basically, dollar yen. At the moment, we're struggling around about this 111, 110 level. We could head back towards around about 112 or 113. Ultimately, I still think the line of least resistance is for a move lower while we're below this cloud resistance here and this trend line resistance from the peaks that we saw in the middle of February. But ultimately, for me, the direction of travel is set. The big question is how we get there, and unfortunately, I can't answer that for you. Similar sort of story for cable. Um, this is something, again, that I covered in my weekly video. Um, we are currently very overbought on dollar sterling, but what we have seen is a potential head and shoulders reversal unfold. With the neckline through here at 144, we've broken above the 100-day moving average at 144 and a half. So potentially, on the basis of this, on the evidence of this breakout, we could test this trend line resistance from the August highs here, which currently comes in around about 147. But ultimately, my target for cable is 151, based on measuring this move here from the lows uh, in March to the neckline and then projecting it from the breakout point. This is a classic inverse head and shoulders breakout. Um, I'm being asked, is, is cable all about Brexit? Yes and no. There is the push-pull effect of what the Fed may or may not do. The pound is actually pulling back because the opinion polls are moving in favor of the Remain campaign. But I also think that an awful lot of the very um, bearish rhetoric was overdone on cable, people talking about 130, 125. When people start talking in those terms, usually they're talking their book, and it usually means it's time to go long. What we've got here is a left shoulder at 140.80, a right shoulder at 140.50, and a neckline which comes in here. So we could fall all the way back to around about 144.5, 
potentially even back to the 100-day moving average. But ultimately, if this breakout pattern here is right, then we're probably going to see initially 147 will come back, potentially head towards 149 over the course of the next few days and weeks, and potentially even go back to 150. Does that necessarily mean that the opinion polls are going to or not going to introduce volatility on the way? Of course they will. And we could well see a big sell-off as we get into June um, and the vote gets closer. So by no means is this a done deal that we're going to go higher, but certainly on the basis of the price action, then you have to have a target, you have to have a view. And my view is that we're more likely to see 150 than we are 140. Yeah, I mean, that certainly does look like it's recovering here. That's a beautiful pattern. And in fact, where you've had the, the falling neckline, if you draw it straight across as, a, as a, a horizontal neckline, that's pretty much where we are right now. So we're retesting mm. that peak of early February. And if we start going through that and that blue trend line you've got on there, uh, that looks pretty good. And that, uh, that initial one also where you've got the, uh, the Fibonacci level and the 200-day moving average uh, mm. also looks quite intriguing as a cluster point where you could see an initial move on a breakout. So, uh, and Michael's right. I mean, we've, got, we've had a lot of volatility, but I think the, the Brexit fears were uh, in, in built in, in trading into the uh, sterling was, was getting really overdone uh, back in February. And, and we're seeing that as, as we go through that this right shoulder has been carved out among still what we would have think would have been more bearish talk, and we had every one of these downward pulses was related to to something whether it was a, a polls favoring the uh, the Leave campaign or or uh, some of the uh, things that uh, Boris Johnson had done with with joining the the thing and some of the the uh, turmoil in the cabinet and stuff like that. And each of these pulses down though through March and in, and April have not been able to push it lower, and that's telling you that that the limits of pessimism in, in cable have probably been reached, and, and now we're seeing it working up. But again, we're, June is a is probably going to be all over the place, just like we saw with the, with the Scottish vote and, and to a lesser extent the election last year. Mm. And if you look at the um, if you look at the um, slow stochastic, the oscillator, it is looking a little bit overbought. So at these sorts of levels, I would suggest the air is a little bit thin, and we could drift back down towards the moving averages over the course of maybe the next couple of days. But that's not to say that I don't think we could go higher. The big question is how we get there. And at the moment, given where we are, um, certainly in relation to this year, we're probably at the higher levels of where I thought we'd be, say, two or three weeks ago. So we'll just have to wait and see how this plays out. And it's a similar sort of story on Euro-Dollar as well. I think the balance of probabilities on Euro-Dollar suggests we go higher, not lower. But ultimately, we're in a range. And we've been in a range for quite some time, as borne out by this one-year chart here. And we can see, you know, we can see where the clusters of resistance are, because apart from the occasional spike through 115 in August last year and and February last year, we've pretty much been trading sideways as well on euro dollar, in the same way that we've been trading sideways in the S&P which is quite interesting. If we break higher in euro dollar, we could see the S&P trade lower, because if you turn that chart upside down, you might as well be looking at the S&P. Yeah. That is, a, by the way, a massive double bottom, ascending triangle, and basically a huge base for me. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's, it's really counterintuitive, isn't it? Because, you know, you're talking Mario Draghi, you're talking negative rates, and you're talking potentially further euro downside, further dollar strength, and yet the price action would appear to suggest that, that for all of that rhetoric, the market doesn't want to go lower. It just does not want to go lower. Every time the market wants to push euro dollar lower, it finds a steady stream of buyers at steadily higher levels. We yeah. bottomed in December, then we got January, then we've got March, now we've got April. Yeah, and so, that December was a double bottom, and I, I yeah. think what we're getting to is we're kind of getting out to the end of this easing stimulus cycle. We're not there yet. They're still talking like they're trying to do more, but I, I think one thing we've seen is that when the uh, when the first stimulus came in several years ago, led by the Fed, it was working and it was helping, and now we're getting the more stimulus comes in, the less effect it's having, and of course that's, that's normal, but uh, we're still getting the rhetoric, but we're not getting the results, and sooner or later I think the street is seeing that this is going to come to an end, and they're going to have to start going back the other way, or at least to neutral, at least back to neutral. The pendulum's out. It's the pendulum. 
Yeah, and, and, one and it's, and it's yeah. starting to swing back the other way. Yeah. Um, and certainly in the context of these, this, this particular chart here, certainly based on the price action of the last five months, the euro is finding, uh, finding support at progressively higher levels. And that suggests to me the shorts are going to get stale in euro and they're going to get impatient and eventually they're going to lose patience and they're going to bust it through 115 and we're going to go to, go to 120 based on the price action that we're seeing right now. Certainly if you look at this spike lower here and the long shadow on this candle, that would seem to suggest that every time we go lower, um, you know, we're, we're finding buyers the buyers aren't waiting anywhere near as long as they did in the past. So, you know, euro, euro dollar and cable do look as if they could actually go higher and not lower, which brings us neatly on to euro sterling. Um, we're overrunning slightly, but I think that's fine as long as you guys are prepared to, to stick with us. Euro sterling, I posted on my blog the other week, a very nice bearish engulfing down. week. So that suggests that we are probably going to test the bottom of this level here around about 76.90 while, we while we're below 78.60. And the oscillator is turning over. That suggests that probably we're pro we are probably going to drift lower. We may squeeze higher first around about 78.60, but overall, now that we're back below the 200-week moving average, which is disappointing given that we broke above it, false break, we're probably going to trend back lower towards 78, 78, 76.90 and potentially 75.20. If you look at it on the daily chart, it's probably not as cut and dried. We are looking to find a little bit of a base around here, which would suggest that maybe we're probably going to range around here a little bit, maybe test here, but ultimately rebound back towards these sorts of levels here. So a stronger pound, slightly weaker, slightly weaker euro over the course of the next few sessions, I would suggest. Um, is there anything else, um, gents, ladies, that you would want us to cover before I move on to Brent crude? Because that also ties in with the dollar story that we've been talking about and the FOMC. I uh, apologize if this chart looks a little bit cluttered. But again, it's surprising how um, similar to euro dollar, actually, this Brent crude chart looks in terms of where the market is going. We've we we bottomed out. This is Brent in January. Um, we've slowly started to ratchet higher. The lows are getting higher. The highs are getting higher. Momentum is taking us higher. And when we broke out here, my minimum price objective, and again, I covered this in a video a few weeks ago, was $44 a barrel. We've hit it. We've now overshot it. So now the next resistance level is around about $47.60 a barrel. So again, it's a similar sort of story. And why is it a similar sort of story? Weaker dollar. The narrative is the same. There's a common theme running through all of this. You know, it was a stronger dollar that sent oil lower. It was a stronger dollar that sent euro lower. It was a stronger dollar that was weighing on stock markets globally. Now that the dollar is starting to weaken, that's when you got the recovery in stock markets at the beginning of February as oil prices started to recover and the dollar started to weaken. So these correlations are important, and it's important to understand how they work. And again here, we've got potentially the 50 coming up to meet the 200-day moving average, but 200-day moving average is trending lower. So even if they cross over, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a strongly bullish signal because the 200-day is moving down. Long-term momentum is still negative despite the fact that short-term momentum is turning positive. Do you want to expand upon that, Colin, or do you want to move on to dollar CAD? Because dollar CAD is a complete proxy for, dollar, for our crude oil. Yes. Let's go on. Actually, we'll go to the dollar cap. But first, I just wanted to mention we're getting a little bit overbought here uh, on the stochastics again. And uh, and so the previous time we saw that back in March, it kind of went sideways for a month. So wouldn't, don't be surprised if we see oil start to level off at some point uh, fairly uh, fairly soon. And let's Are go to dollar cat. I'm just going to yeah. bring something up here, actually. Just give me one second. Sure. Um, so I'm going to bring up dollar cat for you because it's a nice sure, little chart do. here. While we're on the topic, the U.S. DOE inventories have come out. 
and they're showing a rise of just under about 2 million barrels for the U.S. crude oil and a rise of 1.6 million barrels for gasoline. So that contradicts the uh, decline I we can. had in the API inventories last night, and so that could put a bit of a cap on crude oil in the near term. And, and so for WTI, we're looking at, at about $45. And uh, and so the reason I wanted to mention that was going now into, and we're seeing that come back off a little. Thanks, yeah, Michael. Yeah, we are. And so yeah, I wanted me to mention that on, term chart. on the Canadian dollar as well. So w this is a WTI chart. We've pushed back off this 138 level, which is at $43.80. So that's actually works as a nice little resistance level. And again, Trend chart, we could well start to drift lower, and that's exactly what is happening right now on that inventory data. We're seeing it right there. We've just dropped pretty much the best part of a dollar already mm -hmm. on the on the back of that inventory data. But that's not a big move in the context of the way oil prices have been moving over the course of the last few days. You can see yesterday's big up move there. Um, so we've dropped the dollar, but look how far up we went yesterday. So even if we give back half of that, we're still up on the week. So it's always important to bear that sort of thing in mind. So what does that mean for the Canadian dollar? Well, let's have a look. It probably means that the Canadian dollar is going to weaken slightly, and certainly we are seeing that play, being played out right now. Yeah, it was getting over, so oversold already on the stochastics and getting close to that 125. So that's 125 for dollar CAD, that's 80 cents for CAD US dollar. That's a really, really big psychological level on both sides of that pair. And uh, and so a point where we would expect and that, in, and especially given the stochastics and the RSI uh, reaching extreme levels, that uh, that is probably getting to a point where we, we would ex be expecting it to pause anyways. And, and now we're we're seeing that uh, that's starting to come back up a little bit with the uh, with crude oil coming back off. So it's uh, it's at a point where it's due for at least a uh, some sort of pause, maybe a, a correction here, minor correction. Although right could, now that trend's pretty solid. And the Federal Reserve could play into that, so you could get good, you could get a, you could get a decent rally in dollar CAD back to around about 127, 128, mm -hmm. without without unwinding the downward momentum that's been in place since January. And again, you know, you look at dollar CAD, um, that's when Brent crude, that's when WTI bo um, bottomed out and um, started to recover. And as soon as um, oil started to recover, and the dollar started to weaken and the Canadian dollar started to strengthen and started to push the dollar lower. So again, the correlation um, effect coming into play there. Let's finish up with gold, shall we, Colin? Because that, old, that, that, that perennial old favorite. Um, and again, you know, since the beginning of the year, gold has been trading pretty much sideways with solid support around about 12.05, decent resistance around 12.80, and we're slap bang in the middle of that. Slightly positive today. Yeah, and I've still been trying to make it with the with gold, whether that's a head and shoulders top or if this is just kind of a sideways trend. Our RSI has been sitting bang on 50 for days, and, and we're seeing mm. the stochastics basically sitting on 50. So that kind of leans to me towards we, we've had this nice run up off a thousand bucks to uh, to 1200 and change, and uh, and now I think we're just kind of uh, we're just kind of digesting that, and we'll probably see that continue in the near term until we get some kind of a direction on um, on the U.S. dollar. We saw with the U.S. dollar it had come down from 100 and has flattened out 94.95, and we're seeing the same thing. Gold being the the inverse of that, that we had the big rally in gold, and now it's kind of flattening out as well. Okay, so. Um, let's actually let's finish off with the Australian dollar because and the Kiwi dollar because we've got um, we've got an RBNZ meeting tonight I believe we Colin. do it's uh, three hours after the Fed so the Fed's at two o'clock uh, Eastern time and the RBNZ at five o'clock p.m. Eastern time so let's have a look at this weekly chart that weekly chart's quite interesting look at that look at that spike higher. Yes, is, I've been watching 70 closely. I talked a little bit about 80 on dollar cat, 70 mm. on on Kiwi dollar because there's been some talk, a little bit of talk lately that officially the the market consensus is that the RBNZ is going to do nothing, but there had been some chatter that maybe they could cut uh, interest rates. But what I do think we'll see one way or another 
is with the Kiwi dollar getting back up to 70, that the, that we watch the statement really closely because I suspected that they'll uh, they'll probably try and talk the dollar down. I think that they don't want the dollar to breach 70 too much, and the Kiwi dollar that is. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so there's two ways that can do that. Either they could outright threaten intervention, and and they have RBNZ is is an activist central bank. They actually do in, intervene in the forex market, so we watch that. Or they could just try and talk the dollar down. One way they could try and talk it down is hinting that they could cut rates, if not if they don't cut rates today, that they could hint that towards cutting rates sometime in the next couple of meetings, and that could put a cap on the dollar as well, which is particularly interesting given the action we saw in the Aussie dollar overnight. Which then brings us neatly on to the Aussie dollar, because that weak inflation reading this morning has increased yeah. the prospect that we could see a rate cut next week. Now, Australian dollar rates are at 2%, or RBA rates are at 2%. Inflation, quarterly inflation came in at minus 0 0.2. But let's look at why quarterly inflation was so weak in Q1. Look at what oil prices did in Q1. Look at what general commodity prices in general did in Q1. It's no surprise that inflation was, or you know, the, the, the economy saw price deflation in Q1. Since then, prices have recovered. Prices have recovered quite considerably. And while the RBA is worried about the strength of the Australian dollar exchange rate, will they, will they cut rates next week? when an awful lot of that deflation is in the rearview mirror. Uh, commodity prices have recovered quite strongly since then. Iron ore has hit $70 a tonne. Copper prices have re r rallied quite sharply, as have oil prices. So I'm thinking that quarterly effect, it's going to be a very knee-jerk reaction for the RBA to cut rates on a quarterly inflation number where commodity prices, in some respects, have rebounded more than 50% from the levels that they were in Q1. It's an interesting one. But certainly, yeah, absolutely. certainly I think a fear of a rate cut is actually driving Aussie dollar lower and obviously the US dollar higher. So let's look at the weekly candle chart. Let's see how we finish this week. And certainly, this chart really doesn't tell us too much. We've got a very long upper shadow there. This looks as if it's going to engulf all of that candle there. But even if it does, what's it, where's it going to bring us down to? This series of lows through here, around about 75, 74, 50. That's only about 130 points below where we are now. Doesn't mean that we can't go lower. There's a good chance we could. But ultimately, I think what could determine that could be next week's Chinese data which is the manufacturing and services PMIs. So keep an eye on this trend line here, ladies and gentlemen. It's around about 75, also coincides with those lows there. If we break below here, then I think there's a good chance that we could then break lower. But ultimately, I think, I think in the short term, this level could hold. We'll get a rebound, and then we might break lower. But we'll see. Anyway, um, Colin, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, no, I think we've pretty much covered everything. Okay. All right. Well, unless there are any other questions, ladies and gents, um, we're going to conclude today's webinar and just like to say thank you all for um, thank you all for attending. Yes, thank you, and we'll talk to you again next week on uh, Friday when we have the non-farm payrolls. Yep, non-farm payrolls Friday next week, 1:15 to 1:45 UK time. Great. Great.